the Germany Experience, the podcast about life in Germany as seen through the eyes of outsiders. And I'm your host, Sean. And if you haven't, subscribe to the podcast. And this week, there is no guest. It's just me. And uh, so the idea is I want to do, uh, I want to answer some questions that you've sent me uh, over the past few weeks. And uh, I have some and I also have some great insights to share you from comments that I've received on my YouTube channel. And uh, if you didn't know, I have a YouTube channel. And uh, basically, I put the videos of interviews that I have with guests up on the YouTube channel. And I'll be putting up some videos of past interviews that I've done uh, in the next few weeks on the YouTube channel as well. So go and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, I will be putting the, sh the uh, link in the show notes when this episode goes live. And uh, I also have some plans for some additional content to uh, go up on the YouTube channel, but I've said too much. I've already said too much. So go to the Germany experience on YouTube and subscribe. And if this is streaming like it should be to YouTube, uh, subscribe to the channel. So as I said, I'm going to get to the questions that you sent me in a little bit. But before we do that, I want to get to some YouTube con comments. And one of the things that I didn't think about was that the great thing about ha having a podcast and having a YouTube channel is that some of the comments that I get are so insightful and enlightening. So if we have a question or we don't, un don't understand something or, heaven forbid, we get something wrong on the episodes, there's usually a lot of people there to comment and help us on the right way. And that's helped me a lot to understand Germany more, basically. Um, so that has been quite something. And I have some YouTube comments, which I feel are quite insightful for people living in Germany. So let's let's get started. So the very first one that I have was on a an episode that I did, uh, actually the first episode that I did this year with Jen from uh, simplegermany.com. And we discussed the cost of living in Germany. It was one of the things that we discussed. And one of the things we spoke about was the kitchen situation in Germany. So if you haven't listened to that, basically what happens is when you move into an apartment in Germany, it's not a given that there will be a kitchen in the apartment. So the idea is that you buy your own kitchen, you move in, and then your kitchen arrives sometimes a few months after you've been in the house. Um, and then uh, when you move, you have to either sell the kitchen to the next person and hope they want it. If they don't want it, you have to move the kitchen to the next house. So that was... That was something, and uh, Gat on YouTube left me a comment that said, let me answer your kitchen question. I love when comments start like that because I'm getting answers to, quest to my questions. Uh, nowadays, Germany is in the process of changing lifestyle, which means that people are moving more often. That has not been the case in the early days. Germans used to stay where they lived for a long time. I was born in 1954, and after having moved out of my parents' home in 1974, I have only moved four times. Four times since 1974, Gat. Yeah. That is uh, amazing. Um, I have moved, I think, five times just since I've been in Germany. <laughs> so that just shows how things have changed. He continues, therefore, I have always preferred to design the kitchen based on my needs and uh, be able to upgrade it to newer technology. Yeah, I, I, I get it. But I think, I think it should be changing, right? Because people don't stay in one place that long anymore. You've got people coming in from foreign countries. You've got people, I mean, even people I know in Germans move around a lot. So I, maybe it's time to just, I don't know. I'm not here to tell a culture what to do. The next one was also to the cost of living uh, episode, uh, the next comment. And th this one was about the Rundfunkgebur. And what the Rundfunkgebur is, the, the monthly fee that we pay to license, to being able to watch TV, to radio. These fees go to those kinds of, uh, the, the, to the public broadcasting uh, systems. And they, uh, yeah, they fund themselves from the, the Hundfunk Beitrag, which is a lot of money, as we discussed in that cost of living episode. It's 17 euros 50 a, a month. And my R12S said, yes, Rundfunkgebur, this is a weird concept, but the system started when there was no private TV in Germany. And at the beginning, only people who owned a radio or TV had to pay, uh, but it was not easy to control. This is the reason why they changed it. Everyone has to pay because you could easily use public TV or radio. I don't like it, but please keep in mind that the public news shows are way better than private news shows. Yeah, okay. All right. <laughs> But it makes sense that it started in private times. But uh, but these are this this is 2021. We've got a whole lot of things like Netflix and Disney Plus and whatever whatever else. Uh, tons of options available to us. And 
I guess it makes it more even more important that these public broadcasting uh, stations still need this money because maybe they're they're losing revenue to these other streaming giants. I don't know. But whenever I watch German TV, there are still a lot of ads. You know, if I'm going to pay 17 euros 50 Rundfunk Beitrag, I would like there to be less ads. Just saying. Um, but of course, this fee also doesn't only go to German TV. It also goes to things like Hörspiele, which are uh, audio plays. I don't know, like, what do you call those? Like audio dramas. And so on. So like, uh, yeah, okay. I, I, I really don't mind paying some kind of fee, but 17 euros 50? That just seems like a little over the top. Uh, Axel K gave me some comments on another episode that I put up. It's the episode with Steph Fuccio where we discussed German idioms. And uh, that was uh, quite interesting. One of the things that we discussed was where these idioms come from. And obviously Steph Fuccio it comes from the United States of America. I come from South Africa. We have no idea between the two of us of what is what with when it comes to the idioms. Uh, so we got a, a few cool explanations on that episode on YouTube. So most German idioms, this is from Axel K, most German idioms come from the post-war period of the 30-year war. Uh, this is that, That's the 30-year religious war in the Middle Ages um, when there was a lot of oppression by the nobility and the church and the poor peasants had no rights or anything to eat. And if there is something you don't have, you talk of it or dream of it all the time. For example, now it's about the sausage. Jetzt geht's um die Wurst. Um die, um die Wurst. Uh, means to live or die, to eat or starve. Fetching the cow from the ice means saving something extremely valuable. Again, food. And uh, 30 years of war, scorched earth, nothing to eat, gangs of robbers stealing and killing. That's where these idioms come from. The most valuable thing was food. And that's quite interesting because a lot of the, I was, one of the things we were wondering also on the Can You German episode was why do these idioms have so much to do with food? And of course, this makes sense. If that's where they originated, um, it makes perfect sense that that is where. Um, then um, he also comments on... I only understand train station. Ich verstehe nur Bahnhof. That's an idiom that means I didn't get any of that. I didn't understand anything I was just told. His explanation for that is that it comes from the First World War um, on the Western Front. In contrast, in contrast to the Allies, German soldiers could not be exchanged every few weeks to recover. They were at the front almost the whole time. And when the German Kaiser gave a speech about the final victory and that there would be a big offensive, the soldiers thought that they could go home by train. So they only understood Barnoff. <laughs> so I haven't fact-checked any of these, so it would be interesting. But there, also with this Barnoff one, there was another slightly different variation of the explanation. A viewer named Michael had a similar explanation, but his was slightly different. The Ich verstehe nur Barnoff idiom was an actual backstory. Directly after World War I ended, the frontline soldiers just wanted to get home, and their only goal left in their minds was to get to the next train station, no matter what the circumstances... Uh, and no matter what their commanding officers said, respectively. So when the commanding officer would give an order, they would go say, one officer would say to the other one, "What's what was his order?" And the other one would say, "I only understood train station." So that was so that 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 makes sense. Uh, very interesting to learn where that idiom came from. Michael on the same episode about the drucken die Daumen, um, which means to wish someone luck. So it's basically you 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 hold your thumbs. Uh, we also put we, in that episode we were questioning why you would say drucken, which we translated as press. But actually, and of course, Michael is right, uh, it translates to uh, drucken with to push, although in principle not wrong, but it is a bit distracting. So drucken can also mean, besides others, to press or to squeeze as well, which there is, uh, which is the case for this idiom. You do not push the thumb, you press it or squeeze it inside your fist as a gesture. So thank you to Michael, Michael, uh, who left that comment on the YouTube a video for that. Um, yeah, so that is the kind of comments that I get on YouTube. I also get some nasty comments, but I'm not going to read those ones now. Why am I going to read the nasty comments? Um, but it is it is fun to learn these things uh, about Germany, and and these are just some examples. And we I've also uh, we had a lot of comments on a YouTube video um, about friendship in Germany, and we're going to get to that. And I'm going to cover some YouTube comments when I cover that in the Q and A that's coming up. Speaking of the Q&A, it's not just coming up, it's now. So uh, these questions were either mailed to me or uh, sent by a Facebook or Instagram. So let's start with prior guest on the show, Amy Holt. What's your favorite typisch Deutsch food? <sighs> uh, um, I've, 
unfortunately, Amy, I have to be really boring here because I just, <laughs> I mean, I love a lot of different foods. I had, for example, I had carp for the first time. I live in an area that celebrates carp. They live for their carp. It's called Karpfen auf Deutsch and you get carp season and everyone, like all the breweries in the region, just that's their speciality and that's all you get. So I tried carp for the first time in my life recently and it was great. It was really, really good. They have like a specific way that they baked it and uh, served it. It was uh, much better than I thought it would be. So that was pretty cool. And I love, of course, I love things like Döner and which is, I mean, you could argue if that's traditional German, but it's, yeah. But my favorite, favorite, favorite thing, if I if I go to any beer garden or if I'm in a, a traditional German brewery, I am very boring and I love the schnitzel. I just love schnitzel. That's what it's all I do. And I, I know people will say maybe Austria, it's, it's not exactly German, but to me, it's German. It's traditional and I just love it, but it's very boring. I know. Sorry. Sorry. I couldn't be more interesting about my food choices. A user on Instagram named Hartza is, uh, asked me, is Germany currently in a lockdown? Or does it depend on the city? Oh, hard, sir. It's kind of like a Facebook relationship status. It's complicated. But yeah, to answer your question, the entire Germany is kind of on a lockdown. We have lockdown measures in place, but, but the, those change based on the incidence value, which is how many people per 100,000 in your Landkreis, in your region, got sick with coronavirus in the last seven days. And if it's over... 100 incidents of that. So 100 people got sick in the last seven days. Then they have lockdown measures in place. It gets pretty stringent. We have things, something called an Ausgangssperre, which is where you're not allowed to go out. Um, then you also, we also have, uh, you know, no, no restaurants, n nothing like that open. And they've just introduced measures where things will get a little bit lighter from a lockdown perspective if you go under, I think it was 50 incidents value. Now, unfortunately... The area that I live has been under 100, I mean, over 100 since way back when. So I've literally not done anything, gone anywhere, haven't been to a restaurant in ages. It's just, it's getting crazy. I think it's over 110 days that we've been in lockdown. I got lockdown fatigue. And I think a lot of people do. I will say it's, for me, I have a very good situation. I still have a job uh, and I, I'm lucky enough to have a, a family that I get to spend time with and we have enough space where we are. So for me, this is like a, a minor inconvenience. I am well aware of the privilege that I, that I have in that situation because there are a lot of people that have had it a lot worse. Um, and I don't deny that. And, and this is like complaining on a, a, a trivial level, if you want to say that, but it is, uh, it is tiring to still be in lockdown and it's confusing. I don't know what's going on. Like the incidence value changes. I'm not going to watch an instant incidence value every day to see what are we this, what are we today? And if they, if the kids go back to school, like they did in Nuremberg, which is near to where I am. And then suddenly the incidence value is over hundred. The kids don't go to school anymore. No one knows what's going on. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So it's not practical. Let's put it that way. Next question. And this is, this is a big one because <laughs> Uh, it's something that comes up a lot, and I think a lot of people want to know. And it came from someone, I'm going to mispronounce uh, her Instagram profile, Punik, t Punik, Punik t Kaur. Punik t Kaur. All right. And she asked me this question in German. So I've translated it into English. Uh, As a foreigner, how can you develop close friendships with Germans? Woo. Okay. If I knew the answer to this, first of all, I would go out in my village and make friends with all of the Germans. I would just make friends with every single one of them. And then I would write a book about it, explaining how I made friends with all of the Germans. The point is, there is no hard and fast rule. This is a difficult thing that we're talking about. It's very difficult because you're trying to make friends with someone from another culture. I've only ever moved to Germany. I've only been a foreigner or an expat in Germany. So I can only talk from limited experience. I don't know if it's like this in other countries, but it's tough. It's tough. But the thing about this is it's very tricky because every German is, of course, different. Every individual German is different. Uh, so, and also there's a lot of stereotypes that go around uh, about that. So I would say the the German friends that I made in my early German day, days in Germany when I couldn't speak very good German, they were people who were kind of n more naturally open. They were just they had a lot of international friends as well. So it was like something that they liked 
to do. They would, they didn't mind whether they were hanging out with Germans or uh, people from other cultures and, and they were just more gregarious and open to it. So I, I think what I would say is if you can find those in the early days, those Germans, just, just cling to them, just, just hold on to them, but, um, but not too much because, you know, creepy, but uh, those are the Germans that can give you a good entry into the culture, but it's not always easy to find them. You have to be going out. You have to have chance meetings with them or you, you're working with them. But if you spot one of those more open Germans, more naturally friendly, just, you know, try and get in there. Um, the other thing that I can say from personal experiences, just don't rush it. Like you just go with the flow. Don't invite them over for dinner for a while, because this seems to be something Germans find uh, a little more intimate, if you want to say, like full-on dinner at someone's house. For me as a South African, this was just a step. Like if I met someone that was kind of cool, I would say, hey, come over and we'll, let's have dinner. You know? and, and that was just, that was just, it was not a big deal. But Germans view having a meal at someone's house as kind of a big deal. This is just my feeling. And of course, always remember, I'm, I, I'm talking from my own experience and every region in Germany is also different. So this might be different where you are. Uh, but where I was in the beginning, I will never forget, we had a, a young guy who was a German student at the time, and he, uh, we, we were friends with him. And uh, we would go, he would invite us out to nightclubs, we would go to nightclubs. And, uh, you know, that was that was that. And then my wife suggested that we get to that he comes over to us for a meal. And his reply to her was something along the lines of, we don't do that. <laughs> So, you know, it was a, it was a quite a mean shoot down for us. Like you were just, what did I say? What did I do? How is that? What have I done wrong? You know, what, but you know, it, with hindsight, I realized like he was just being honest, like too soon, we're not going to do dinner. So just keep that in mind. Like that seems to be uh, a big deal for the Germans. And I, I remember I saw a post on Facebook a few days ago of someone who just moved into a new complex and he said, can I invite my Ger my German neighbors who are very nice over for a meal? And like, no, <laughs> don't. It's way too soon. Uh, and what you need to do is first start off with cafe and kuchen, maybe coffee and cake, um, or some other kind of thing where you just hang out and get to know each other. Like, and even barbecues, even though you could think of them as uh, as dinner or lunch at someone's place, they're more informal. They're outdoors, um, so feel free to invite Germans over for a grill. At times, I think that could work. Uh, a bit easier than dinner. But of course, the other thing we have at the moment is coronavirus complicating this. So I don't know how you're making friends, new Germ new people in Germany. I don't know. I like, I don't know how you're doing it. So, uh, but I also feel it's quite important to differentiate here that what, what we're talking about when we're talking about friendly and how, how friendly Germans are, because Germans are friendly, contrary to the popular stereotype. And in fact, just today I was at a Baumarkt um, and the cashier couldn't have been more charming or funny. Uh, it, we, we just had, I had a great encounter with her. And then when I was loading, I, I bought quite a big item at the bar and I was trying to put it into my car and it was quite heavy and awkward. And a German just passing by, he's got his own things to do. Uh, he just stopped and offered to help me. So it was, uh, you know, that's the kind of thing that you can uh, accept, uh, expect in Germany. And in fact, even in my early days, I always felt that I would always be able to rely on strangers if I ran into difficulties. It's just Germans are friendly in that way and they're very helpful and they will always stop and, and, and people won't just leave you in trouble. And especially if you ask for the help, you'll, you'll probably get it. However, if you expect them to invite you around after they've helped you, <laughs> you're going to be disappointed. So, uh, and there's the difference. Germans, Germans are actually friendly and helpful, but de developing that meaningful relationship with them is, is difficult, which means that you need to define what you mean by friendship. If you're looking for someone to do stuff with, Germans are very good for that. They, they love doing like fried side activity or playing sports or something like that. If you're looking to hang around them, find something like that to do, because they're very good at that. The you know just doing stuff, rock climbing. I know many Germans who go rock climbing, or they're, they're, you know they're very active, or uh, wandern, hiking, uh, things like that. So, uh, yeah. But if you're expecting them to invite you into their inner circle, you, you're going to need to wait a little while. So it depends what you want from the friendship. If you just want someone to hang out with, a bit of a, a glimpse into German culture, you can get that. You can definitely get that. Um, but if you want that meaningful relationship, it's going to take time and may never develop. So there is that. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Some answers from my YouTube 
uh, comments. And specifically on the episode, there was an episode with Amy from the USA, who was the first comment, the first question that I read in this um, uh, question and answer, by the way, she, her video on YouTube, it's just the audio version, but her video on YouTube had a lot of activity and a lot of Germans offering advice. And uh, I'll just read you some of the concept, the, some of the comments that came under that video, because it, it's really helpful from a German perspective, Germans offering help on how to be friends with them. The one said, <laughs> this is kind of my favorite because it's a little bit of a, 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 a mean comment, if you want to say it that way. Maybe cynical is a better word. In a small town, once you've told your story, everyone knows within a few weeks. So why should anyone bother asking you about it again? What? <laughs> it's like, I don't even know what that's supposed to, how, like, okay. To make friends, join a local sports club or invite your neighbors to a barbecue and attend the local fests. Uh, Lothar also said, join a Verein. And that's like a, a, a group, um, a community of, some, of people who have f the similar tastes. My advice, try to find a club that fits your interests and get involved in it. I uh, hope you make progress with that advice. And by the way, it boosts your chances if you and your husband did find different clubs. And then Martin, who wrote this originally in German and I translated it. Um, so hopefully I get the meaning across, but he says to meet more people, it's uh, still good with a dog. <laughs> if you want, if you want to make friends in Germany, get a dog. That's also from a German. Uh, the clubs are of course, uh, still a classic base for contacts. There is a club for every hobby. And there really is. There really is. I've heard of potato clubs. What happens when three Germans get together, they start a club. So it's quite common. Uh, he also continued, <laughs> there is something else stupid in Germany. You are educated to keep your distance. And this, I think, is really insightful uh, comment. One is embarrassingly careful not to get on anyone's nerves not to be too intrusive until you have your neighbor in the kitchen for a coffee to organize this un-German activity of small talk years can pass always because there is this fear. Yeah, she invited me, but I have three children. I'm just going to take time. Oh, she has three children. I'm just going to take time away. The family must think I have no home. And I think that's, I've noticed that about the Germans. They are that's like, until I read this comment, I didn't really formulate in my mind, but he's right. Like Germans are embarrassingly careful not to get on anyone's nerves in one way. There is of course the other way that they're completely, they're very direct people. And he, my favorite part of his comment is this here. So in Germany, a perfect stranger could tell you your trousers don't match your jacket. <laughs> the same stranger would run away if you asked him to discuss it over a beer. And that's perfect. That is the perfect analogy, Martin, whoever you are. And he continues, so with the people in Germany who are important to you, stay on the ball, they are simply shy. And I love that comment because there is multiple insights that you can get from it. Although they are very direct, they will say what they mean. They're also shy in a way that they don't want to come over to you for dinner if they've just met you. And it's maybe not because they're being aloof or anything, but they're honestly afraid that they're wasting your time. So this was a a really, really cool, insightful comment from Martin. So yeah, the, I mean, I could talk for a whole podcast episode. I have had several podcast episodes about this on the German experience. The Amy episode was one. There was another one about, uh, I, I can't remember. There was, I think, Tim way back in 2019, we discussed some advice he has. So it's a big issue coming to Germany. And that's why I brought it in here as well, because I, I thought it's, it's good to talk about it every now and then. I can't offer you advice. Everyone's different. Every German's different. You're different. Uh, just keep in mind. And I think this idea of Vereins is a good idea. So if you have, if you want to meet people, find something that you're interested in and go to that and you will meet people with the same interest there. That's like, a, that's already a great start. So yeah. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, I'm not going to try to pronounce your name again. The next question that I had was from Elisa Jordan writes, and she says, do you feel like Germany is your real home now? If yes, why? And if not, why not? Uh, yes, is the simple answer. It does feel like my real home now. And in fact, bizarrely enough, it felt like home very soon after we arrived to both me and my wife. We're both from South Africa and we arrived and it was pretty instantaneous. I just... I just felt comfortable in the culture. And even though there were a lot of frustrations and a, a lot of culture shocks and we struggled with the language, I still struggle with the language, 
it just kind of was, the culture was a fit in some ways. Like I just, you know, I, 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 it's difficult for me to quantify. So for me personally, and for my wife, this did feel like home straight away. Not to say we weren't homesick and not to say we had, we didn't, we weren't frustrated because there were times where I just thought, what am I, what are we even doing here? Let's just go home to South Africa and call it quits here. So there were, there were times like that. Now, um, it is my home. I mean, we have, we have, uh, careers here. We've learned the language to a, a decent, uh, level. We have German passports. Our kids are, you know, taking in the culture and yeah, it's just, it is, it is home. It is home now to answer that question. And following on to that, uh, to the next question, Antoinette, uh, underscore New Zealand, NZ, NZ in, <laughs> from Instagram. And she is, of course, Antoinette Emily from YouTube channel. Uh, I will link to that in the show notes as well. She was also a guest on the show. She said, would you ever consider moving back to South Africa at some point? And kind of following on from the last question, you know, it's something I think of still to this day, because I mean, Cape Town is amazing. If you've ever been to Cape Town, it's beautiful there. Uh, maybe, you know, it would be nice. It, it's nice to entertain the thought of living at the coast and beautiful weather. And, but there is a lot of other things that we left that reasons that we left South Africa. It was very, at that time, high crime rate. It was, you know, we were looking for a safer place to start a family and yeah. So I sometimes entertain the thought, but it's more just a, it would be cool if we lived at the coast with nice weather <laughs> because it would, but it doesn't mean I would actually move back. So I hope, I, I hope that answers that. Then I've got a question from someone named Pam who emailed me and she asked a lot of questions in two emails, uh, which I loved. It, it started with some questions about real estate, which I'm going to be answering in a future episode. And then she sent an, a second email with more questions, which I'm going to save most of them for an ask, uh, the next Ask a German episode. Um, but I just took some questions from Pam to answer in this Q and A. So a personal question for you, why did you and your family choose to move to Germany instead of Australia or New Zealand or somewhere like that where English is also spoken and the weather is much nicer? That's a good question. That is a good question. Sometimes in the, in the early days, I also ask myself like that, why Germany? Why are we doing this to ourselves? Um, I think it was because Australia and New Zealand are both very difficult to get into as a South African. Uh, you had to tick a lot of boxes and you had to be going to a job and a lot of different things. I mean, Germany is pretty tough to get into as well from that perspective. But in some ways, we just had a path through my wife's job where she got a job here in Germany and we were able to utilize that to move over. So it just kind of happened. And at that time, we thought, German, like, I'm sure we'll learn a new language. Um, so it just kind of happened that it was Germany. And I think I think in, in some ways, I'm glad somehow because, yeah, it's given me a great life here in Germany. Uh, also from Pam, her question, apart from free education, what are the other main reasons for people from other developed cultures, uh, countries, sorry, to want to stay in Germany for the long haul? Uh, I would actually say free education is fairly low on the list from just from my experiences of people I've spoken to and guests on the podcast. I would say a more common reason would be love. I know a lot of people, uh, guests and other people in my friend, Freundekreis, my friendship circles, who uh, yeah moved here for a German and stayed here, got married and stayed here and, and love living here. So I would say that was almost the the top reason. And another reason is uh, like like I said about our reason was kind of a, a better life here than you would have in um, countries. But I guess that's from other developed countries is was was part of your question. So yeah, maybe that's not a good answer. And then Pam again. Why is cash still such a prominent means of payment? Is it because of the aging population and that's what the elderly have always done or more about privacy concerns? And I bring this up because the last episode of the German experience was with um, Alex from the USA and she brought up digitization in Germany and how it's lagging behind the rest of the world. And this was one of the things we spoke about is paying by cash. And I think, I don't know, like I think there's a lot of different reasons. I think it has to do with digitization. It has to do with bureaucracy, but it also, you know, uh, one of the first things I noticed when I came to Germany was that it deals differently or Germans deal differently with credit and they don't like credit as such. And in fact, the credit cards work differently. Yeah. So um, well, I don't know if they all work like this, but all the ones that we looked into, you use a credit card and then the whole amount comes off the next month. 
Whereas in South Africa, I was used to paying it off like over six months. You would you would pay your credit off over six months, but here it's just like a, a future debit card. You have it like it's going to come off on your next paycheck, the whole amount. And even that is just like a mindset that I think I think that they they have big issues with debt and getting into a lot of credit, and maybe that's driven some of the things. Like I said, also digitization things things being done the way it's always been done, and Datenschutz. I think that's a big deal as well. Germans and their Darden Schutz uh, are, are they're, they're sticklers for it. But uh, what I can say is that this payment issue, like credit, not not wide acceptance of credit cards, is annoying for the Germans as well. It's not just us foreigners who complain about this. And you just have to go and listen to the Oscar German episode I did uh, back in back last year. They were quite they 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 were quite annoyed by the same thing. So yeah. Thanks, Pam, for those questions. Uh, Henrik on Facebook asks me, asked me, question, what's up with all the reversing into parking spaces? Seems to be a generational thing too. And this was an interesting question because when he, when he asked me, I'm like, yeah, I, there are a lot, like reversing into parking spaces does happen a lot here, but doesn't it in other countries? Like, I can't remember in South Africa if people did that. I just do it because people do it. And then sometimes what happens is one person does it and everyone else just does it. And then you come along and like, why? Like, I'm not going to park forward now if everyone's reversed into the parking. So I just, so uh, long story short, Henrik, I don't know. I don't know why that is. I don't know why. Um, but interesting question. Thank you for that. Wendy, De, uh, Wendy, Wendy, I was going to say Wendy. Uh, I can't remember where this question came in. I think it was on Instagram. How has it been raising kids as an expat? Do they feel different from the German kids? Do they feel different from the German kids? I don't know that yet because my eldest son, who is 10 years old, he has special needs. So he's kind of social development isn't the normal development that you would have. And uh, I have a five-year-old who goes to kindergarten here and she speaks great German. So we, at home, we only speak English. Don't, they don't, the kids don't get any uh, sort of access to German from us because our German, they'll just learn bad habits. But my five-year-old went to a German kindergarten from the age of, I think, two or so. And she's picked up amazing German. It's, it's incredible. We also have a 15-month-old who obviously hasn't been exposed to German yet. She's still at home. She hasn't gone to kindergarten. Um, but the five-year-old fits in well. She's like, I think she was young enough to kind of just ease into the German culture and the German language. And her friends know that we speak German at home. They come and visit us. I mean, not during Corona times, of course, but uh, they, co they come and visit us and, you know, they notice that we speak English with each other and they definitely see it and are aware of it. But I guess they'll only start noticing the differences later on when they get a bit older, I suppose, when, when, when things, and, and one of the big things is traditions. So like we've got our own traditions that we brought from South Africa and we don't know a lot of the German traditions. So we wouldn't be able to teach our ki kids those German traditions. So there, there's going to be more and more, I think that my, that our kids will learn somewhere else that like, Oh, this is what every kid, every other kid does. And I don't, and I don't know if that's going to be something that other kids look at and like, why doesn't, uh, why, why doesn't she celebrate the Christkind or something? I don't know. So it, it's difficult. We've, we're trying to, adopt some of the German tr uh, traditions and ease them, like kind of fit them in between the traditions that we really want to keep from, from South Africa and from our background. But it's tricky because you want to, you want to expose the kids. You don't want them to feel like outsiders, but at the same time, you want them to be true to their roots. So I don't know. I'm waffling on about this, but it's, it's a, it's not an easy, uh, not an easy question to answer. And of course, then with my son having special needs for him, it's, you know, he, he's, he's mostly nonverbal. He's now saying a lot more words and stuff, but, but he's also had it tough because he's struggling to learn just one language, just English. And then he goes out to a special, special needs school here. He has therapy in German. So he's getting exposure to German as well. And like I said, he, he takes it in very slowly and it takes time. And that's also been, um, a question in our minds, like, are we doing the right thing by, by exposing him to the foreign language? We hope that it gives him additional stimulation, but it could be hindering his language development. It's difficult to know. Um, and of course, he was our first child. Uh, first child special needs, I think, is always a difficult situation, regardless of uh, where you are in the world. 
And for us, it was a very, you know, we didn't know what was going on. We didn't know uh, the details of things. And then you're dealing with German doctors. And back then, it was sort of the third or fourth year that we were in Germany. And we were dealing with medical terminology that we didn't understand. And sometimes doctors would tell us something. And we'd realize, like, weeks later, wait, they were trying to tell us something important. We didn't get it. We just, it just, we missed it somehow. So that has also been a huge thing in raising kids for us, is having a special needs kid where we had to learn a very specific kind of jargon. Um, but it's, but it's also, you know, it, it's, it's just one of those things. I think he gets a lot of benefits from living in Germany as well, from, from all the kinds of things that the medical aid offers and, and so, and so, uh, and, and great therapy here as well. So it's, it's been, it's been interesting to see all sides of it. And yeah, I think, uh, it, it's, it's not an easy question to say, to answer, but I think we'll see in the next few years how other kids see my kids <laughs> and, uh. If, if that if they feel different to the other kids, then I had a question from the expat cast, who is Nicole, by the way, and uh, she asks, "What's your cringiest? I've become too German moment." And this is a difficult question because I've become German in many things that I don't even notice it anymore. It's only when I speak to foreigners on my podcast uh, or other friends that I realize, "Oh yeah, I've." I do that now and I never used to do that at home. So it's very difficult for me to pinpoint my cringiest moment. But I think, I think maybe like when I go back to South Africa and there's no one to see, like you go to a restaurant and there's no one to see you to your table and then you sit down and within five minutes you haven't like had someone take your drink order. I get antsy now, nowadays. I mean, that's standard for South Africa, but now I get antsy. Like I need to be seated and I need someone to be taking my drinks order very soon after arriving. And if it doesn't happen, so I get, I get annoyed. And then I immediately want to start complaining in the restaurant and like all my South African family or friends are just like, what are you talking about? This is, this is, the service is fine. Yeah. So that it, there is, uh, yeah, it's not a very good cringy moment, but it, it's what I could think of. Yeah. That is it for this Q and a session. Um, I hope that you enjoyed hearing about it. Next week, I'm going to be having a guest again on the show. It'll be Nina, uh, who's who, who returns. She's been on the show like the second amount, second most amount of times of anyone. Um, but it's always a pleasure to have her. And we're going to be talking about uh, gestures that Germans make and some some one word expressions or syllables that they say. Uh, and she's going to explain them to us. Like, what do Germans mean when they do these things? So I'm very excited for that. Thank you for watching. Uh, thank you for listening. If you're listening to this on in your podcast feed, don't forget to subscribe to the show. Uh, if you have any questions for me, I'd like to do more of these Q&A sessions in the future. Send me your questions to info at thegermanyexperience.de. You can go to thegermanyexperience.de forward slash contact and you can send me a message there or leave me a voicemail on my website. That's possible too. Yeah, I think that is it for this for this episode. Yeah, and that means... Auf Wiederhören.